All right. Hi, everyone. This is Amelia Keaton. I am filling in for Dr. Shelley Siskis today, who um, unfortunately wasn't able to make it. But for those of you who don't know me, I am the Interim Director of the Healthcare Associated Infections Program for the Tennessee Department of Health. Um, we will be joined today by Dr. John Workington, um, who is the Medical Director of our TB Elimination Program, who has also been working really closely with the Tennessee Department of Corrections on testing of the inmate population and staff population there, and so hopefully he can give us a, a quick update on those activities during this call as well. And then we also um, hopefully will be joined by Dr. Pam Talley, who is uh, the director of our HIV, STD, and viral hepatitis program, but who is doing a lot of work with long-term care facilities uh, to help facilitate the state's testing initiative in that environment. Um, so in terms of um, just topics for today, I wanted to start by just providing um, a link to the physician support line. We know that all of you out there on the front lines are doing a lot of very great but very stressful work and sometimes you just need somebody to chat with or um, vent to. We completely recognize that. I know that I certainly have found myself in that boat many times during my life. Um, so just wanted to pass on this resource for you all out there. Um, I think there's been a lot of good feedback from, from the support offered by this line. Um, in terms of the where we are in the Tennessee Department of Health response, we are about 121 days into our incident command structure. We are now 71 days since our first case, although it feels like a lifetime, and I know it probably feels like more than one, a lifetime for the folks out there in the field. Um, for clinicians out there who need a consult or need additional information, we are still using the 615-741-7247 clinician call line. Um, that line is staffed by multiple people during daytime and business hours, and then overnight there's a, a clinician or an epidemiologist on call who is also available to answer questions. Um, in terms of where we stand in the United States, we are now over a million cases. That is a total of 426 cases per 100,000 residents. We are over 80,000 deaths at this point and we are over 150,000 hospitalizations. Um, in terms of where we stand with other countries, um, I imagine it is a, no surprise that the United States ha now has many fold higher uh, cases than Spain, Italy, and South Korea, and, and there are no signs that things are slowing down, unfortunately. Um, for Tennessee, we are sort of in the middle of the pack in terms of the southern states, in terms of the cases diagnosed, with Georgia having the highest number of confirmed cases over time and Kentucky having the lowest number of cases over time. Um, however, Tennessee, I think, is doing a great job in getting the testing number increase, which we know is a huge portion of controlling this epidemic and trying to perform containment exercises. We are leading the pack um, in the number of tests performed. We are slightly above Georgia, as you can see on the graph on the left. Um, and, you know, again, in terms of the number of confirmed cases, even though we perform more tests, we are still sort of in the middle of the road in terms of the number of confirmed cases. Uh, this data was updated as of 2 p.m. yesterday. Um, so as we increase our number of tests, we also increase the number of cases that are detected. Um, we are trying to keep this data updated every day um, by 2 p.m. We're trying to also make that data accessible for folks out there in the field and also trying to make the data um, interpretable by region since we know that some regions are more heavily impacted than others, um, in particular the Shelby County Memphis metro area and the Nashville Davidson metro area as well. Um, there is one county of the 95 in Tennessee that has no reported cases yet, and that would be Hancock County. Um, they've t tested 104 folks so far. Um, so uh, I guess probably um, a lot of us wish that we were there right now, but I know a lot of you are sort of in the thick of COVID-19 and, and we will continue to help support you as, as numbers increase over time. Um, in terms of hospitalization, we, our hospitalization rate thus far is 9% of cases, 54% um, have not been hospitalized as a result of their illness, but we don't have information on 38% of these. So. Um, you know, interpret that information with a grain of salt. 
Um, similar to what we're seeing on the national level, there are certain races and ethnicities that appear to be more heavily impacted than others, and we are trying to do our best to understand those trends and also help address them. Um, in particular, in Tennessee, we're seeing a, a high proportion of black or African American folks who are affected with COVID-19. They are also having a disproportionately high uh, rate of death as well, and so obviously a complex situation there that we are doing our best to try to address. Um, just another way of interpreting the data, similar to what we had seen early in the outbreak and, and what is reported by CDC, um, a large majority of the deaths that are occurring in Tennessee are occurring in the population over 60 years of age. And some of this is related to long-term care facilities and uh, the, the rapid rate of spread in congregate settings. Some of it is also related just to the higher level of susceptibility to severe illness in this age group of population. Um, wanted to provide a quick update on point of care testing. So as of right now, we know of four CLIA waves molecular test platforms. One that has gotten a lot of attention this week has been the Abbott ID Now, which was one of the first point of care tests released for COVID-19. And I think a lot of us were very excited to see this option. However, oh, sorry, um, we unfortunately have seen reports this week um, and over the past month from both the Cleveland Clinic and the uh, New York University School of Medicine that have reported that this test has poor sensitivity, which is the ability to detect a positive case in a patient. So um, we've seen reports that as many as 25% of people who are tested via this platform that are truly positive for COVID-19 test negative, meaning that they um, had a false negative result. And the way that they, they have identified this is by testing uh, specimens that were tested by other platforms. And so FDA at this point, I think, has recommended that Abbott perform post-market testing at several sites using this platform to help determine what the issue there is. Um, they have not made a blanket recommendation to say to stop using this test, as they've said that the positive results that you obtain from the Abbott ID now are, uh, are worth trusting. Um, it's just if you have somebody with a clinically compatible illness or with an exposure to COVID-19, this may not be the best mechanism of performing testing. And also something that I know will be very um, of, of high concern for folks on this call would be COVID-19 in children. And so the CDC yesterday released um, their health alert network um, advisory regarding the multi, uh, excuse me, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MISC, associated with COVID-19. And so what this is is a syndrome of multiple symptoms um, that tend to occur in people either currently infected with COVID-19 or recently infected with COVID-19. The symptoms and um, clinical picture of these patients tend to be very similar to what you see with Kawasaki disease and that you can have changes in your skin, prolonged fevers, changes in lab values like low albumin. Um, but what folks are seeing, though, is that there tend to be other symptoms that are not classically associated with Kawasaki disease, and in particular, that would be respiratory symptoms that often require care in the intensive care unit. Um, the CDC has not recommended specific treatments for this so far, but out in the clinical world, we are seeing folks at large uh, pediatric referral centers using immunomodulatory agents similar to what would be used for Kawasaki disease. So things like IVIG, high-dose steroids, and in some cases, um, other more targeted disease-modifying agents. But again, I think if you have suspicion that you have a patient with um, MISC, we first urge that you um, have that patient evaluated if possible by a pediatric infectious disease clinician and or a pediatric rheumatologist. It also is likely um, necessary to ensure that that patient is within uh, reasonable access of a critical care setting just due to the respiratory symptoms that can be associated with this condition. Um, if you are a clinician who is seeing one of these patients and you suspect that they have this, please contact our, the Tennessee Department of Health to report it. We are starting to track this information so that we can help um, release more systematic studies and, and obtain more information about its prevalence. And you can uh, report those by contacting amanda.hartley at tn.gov, and you can see her email address right there. 
Um, switching gears a little bit, um, so as many of you have heard, we at the Tennessee Department of Health are working really hard to try to po uh, perform population testing among specific vulnerable populations, and those include prison inmates due to the congregate nature of those settings, long-term care facilities, again, because these patients tend to be at higher risk with other health comorbidities that would make them at risk for um, severe illness. And then other vulnerable populations who may live in subsidized housing, homes for the aged, and Department of Developmental Disabilities congregate care settings. Um, and so we are working with a lot of different groups to help facilitate this. We know that it is quite the ask for those of you who work with any of these types of facilities and we're trying to work out the logistics of this as quickly as possible. Um, the, one of the you know, big purposes of performing this mass testing is so that we can facilitate contact tracing and then also isolation of patients who test positive in hopes of limiting and mitigating the spread within these vulnerable populations and settings. Um, it also helps us get um, a good sense of whether alternate care sites need to be opened or set up in, in specific areas, um, particularly those with higher cases because um, you know, if hospitals or other healthcare settings that are already established are overwhelmed with the number of cases, obviously we need to step in and try to provide more resources for that. And then finally, having this information helps with the procurement of supplies, um, so things like PPE, additional testing swabs that are needed for serial testing in patients where there's been a huge number or a large number of um, people who have tested positive, we know that those who test negative may still have been exposed and may need additional testing in the future. So all of the, the purpose of these efforts is really just to get a snapshot of where we are in the state and where we are in different settings so that we can plan accordingly for the future. Um, so my team, which is the Healthcare Associated Infections team, has focused really um, almost um, from the beginning on long-term care facilities just because they're of the information that came out early that these populations were hit pretty hard. Um, within Tennessee, we, as, we'd already, as we have already mentioned, about 30% of the deaths and 4.9% of the cases in Tennessee have occurred in clusters in long-term care facilities. Um, and the fatality among identified cases that are part of long-term care facility clusters is 10.6%, so a very serious illness that we are trying to deal with. Um, so as a lot of you have probably noted, we are tracking uh, the facilities that have two or more cases confirmed among residents or staff members on our website every day. Uh, the purpose of this is, is not to be punitive in any way, but really just to be transparent about where things are. Um, similar to what other states are doing. Um, and then what we do once we have this information is we try to work with these facilities by either performing infection prevention and control assessments by phone or in person so that we can help support and mitigate the spread within these facilities. Um, And with that, I wanted to introduce Dr. John Workington, who is our um, point contact for testing initiatives in correctional facilities. Um, I know this is not something that has, um, that is something that a lot of us think about currently, but I think it is something that has gotten a lot of attention and is actually a very interesting aspect of this um, outbreak. So, Dr. Workington, are you on the phone? John, are you there? If you're talking, we can't hear you. All right, well, maybe we can come back to him um, if he's able to join in just a second. Um, so one final thought I wanted to leave everybody with before we move on to the question portion of things and hopefully Dr. Workington can join us shortly um, is that health departments across the state still have drive-through testing capabilities. We just ask that you call the location where you want to be tested um, for their hours of operation and to schedule an appointment if that's necessary at the specific location. Um, so you can access those um, sites by going to our website, which you can see there. We're trying to update that as more testing sites come online. Um, also, as a quick reminder, we are requesting that folks 
who want to request PPE due to shortages in their clinic or in their practice uh, follow the steps here on this slide, which I think Dr. Fiscus has, has given previously and it has not changed. <laughs> Uh, Dr. John, is that you? Can you hear me now? Uh, we can hear you, but there's a pretty bad echo. If you're there, could you try picking up your phone and going that route? Dr. John, are you there? Uh, so maybe we'll just answer a few questions while we're trying to sort out the technical issues there. So one of the questions that we have gotten so far is that are there guidelines that suggest the positive patient should be retested before removing from isolation, or do you just go by seven days from symptom onset and three days asymptomatic? So that is a great question. So the guidance actually recently changed from CDC to change the, um, the time for isolation from seven days to a minimum of 10 days. Um, the reason for that being that we believe that there is likely a longer period of shedding for some patients than others. And so now the guidance is for a person to be in isolation for a minimum of 10 days and for that person to have been asymptomatic for three days. Um, and that 10-day timeline also follows for people who are asymptomatic. So they're using the 10-day period from the time the test was performed. Um, there is the option to perform testing again before somebody is removed from isolation. I think with the shortage of testing, or the relative shortage of testing, even though it's improving, we have been recommending that folks use the, the time or symptom-based criteria for removing from isolation as opposed to uh, doing repeat testing. CDC reworded their guidance recently to remove that preference for testing as well. Um, another question that we just got, if someone has a known exposure, such as um, at home or at work, what is the optimal time after exposure to be tested, uh, particularly if they are asymptomatic? So that is another good question. I think it's one that we unfortunately don't have a great answer for, especially if somebody is asymptomatic. We know that the, the average duration of time from exposure to symptom onset is five days, and so I think that could be a rule of thumb if you're trying to come up with a good um, mechanism or, or timeline for testing. Um, but again, not something that there are formal guidelines or that there are formal guidelines out there yet for. I think if somebody is um, is symptomatic, obviously that gives you a good <laughs> a good indicator when they should be tested. But we don't have a a, a great rule of thumb yet for those with um, without symptoms. Uh, so another test or another question regarding testing is whether or not drive-through centers are doing deep nasal swabs, and if so, why aren't the shallow nasal swabs sufficient, um, as Dr. Burke stated? So the goal of testing really is to collect epithelial cells from the portion of the nose that would harbor virus. Um, we know that collecting a swab at the back of the nose is probably going to get you the best specimen, even though it is uncomfortable. Um, that is what we have the most experience with, and we think if we're doing testing, we want to make sure we get the best specimen possible. Uh, with that said, we know that a large portion of the swabs that we get and test and the test positive are probably coming from more shallow nasal swabs. So I think, um, you know, that certainly is, is an option, but I think there is still the concern that by getting that more shallow specimen, you may not necessarily collect the virus if somebody doesn't have a high vi viral burden at the time that you're doing the testing. Uh, the next question we have is, when is it safe for a COVID-positive patient who is symptomatic to have elective surgery if they have waited until they are without symptoms and they've had two PCR tests that are negative, separated by greater than or equal to 24 hours? 
So that is a great question, and I think it's also one that we don't have a good rule of thumb for thus far. I think that obviously would probably be the safest option to have two negative PCR tests, but I would also add the caveat that we know people can shed virus that is detectable by PCR for quite some time, even if they are no longer symptomatic. Um, so, you know, I think that is the guidance that has been um, advertised by CDC. I think as we learn more about this virus, we're learning that people may have detectable virus even though they're no longer contagious, and, and we don't really know how to um, interpret that so far. Uh, um, you know, in terms of timing for surgery, I think the longer, the better that you can wait. So, um, again, I apologize for not having a more uh, definitive answer on that one, but it is something to consider. Uh, Dr. Workington, are you on the line yet? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Uh, sorry, everyone. We're going to switch back uh, to talking about correctional facilities, and I think Dr. John's got some really good insights and just experiences from doing testing in these populations over the past couple of weeks. So, uh, Dr. John, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thanks, Amelia. And I apologize to all of you for the technical difficulties. Uh, what uh, I discovered with the help of my colleagues here is that my desk phone was forwarded to my cell phone, and that's why there was an echo. Uh, again, I apologize for that. Uh, uh, disturbance. Um, I'll be very brief. I was just, uh, actually asked to uh, lead the um, interaction between Tennessee Department of Health and the Tennessee Department of Correction uh, here in the state in terms of their testing with um, uh, both private labs and the state public health lab for all employees and vendors at uh, 15 to 20 different prison sites across the state as well as all offenders. A couple of those prisons had already been tested by the time the state health department became involved. And I think that on the, um, the slide that you see for correctional facilities, you see Bledsoe County and Trousdale County. Uh, those have been in the media because of the, the, the high number of uh, tests that were reported there. But that was prior to the state health department's involvement in the testing process. I would point out that as of today, um, Bledsoe County Correctional Complex uh, has 587 cases within that prison, um, and Trousdale uh, Turner Correctional Complex has 1,303 tests, and this was actually reported on national media as I believe being maybe the third largest uh, prison-related outbreak of COVID-19 in the whole country. Um, now we also know because of the, the statewide testing process within the state prisons that the Northwest Correctional Complex uh, in the top left-hand corner, tiny little county called Lake County, it says 401 on the map, there are 381 cases within that prison. Um, in the bottom left corner of the state, uh, you see a county that has the number 179 in it. I believe that is Hardeman County, and within a uh, commercially or privately run prison there, currently there are 152 cases. So among these four prisons, Northwest Correctional Complex, Hardeman County Correctional Facility, uh, Trousdale Turner, and uh, Bledsoe, there are um, over 2,400 cases, and that accounts for approximately 94% of all cases in the state prisons. This has been a very interesting experience, as you might imagine, in uh, prisons as well as jails. The top priority is, um, is security um, and safety for security officers and so on. Typically, um, in prisons, there is a budget for health care. Our state prison system has a contractor called Core Civic, which uh, operates uh, some of the uh, prisons themselves, and there is a um, healthcare um, subcontractor, if you will, which does some of the, the uh, healthcare work in uh, a number of the prisons. We have been working with all of these groups in terms of coordinating the testing and the reporting of results statewide. Um, as you can imagine as well, uh, prisons are a um, as, a, as an analogy that I heard last night, um, 
uh, just a, a tinderbox, uh, dry grass waiting for a fire to blow through it. In terms of transmission of a number of diseases, whether it's MRSA or whether it's um, COVID-19, that has happened in a couple of places. And most likely from infected um, employees or vendors who work in those prisons, and then perhaps being reassigned to another prison. Um, we will be most likely working closely with some county jails to do something similar here in the next couple of weeks that may be coming to a county near you. Um, and uh, we think that that's going to be a, a different kind of process. Uh, the sheriffs uh, in the counties will make a decision which they think best suits their environment and their need, whether they opt into the process or now or not. The Tennessee Department will stand by to help uh, assist with PPE um, and with the, the testing process with laboratories as well as reporting of results. So stand by. There's much more to come on this as uh, we continue our work uh, with congregate settings around the state. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. John. Um, in your experience with working with these facilities, what sorts of interventions have they put in place for those who have tested positive? Are there any um, changes in how um, you know traffic among among inmates in the prison and among those who are um, supervising them? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, the, the first step is speaking first of all about um, uh, employees. Uh, and contractors, those folks are contacted immediately when a positive test is received and told to stay home. Those folks are on, I think they're using 14 days uh, as the standard guidance for those folks to not return to work. Um, however, the vast number of these uh, cases are among offenders. And so those folks are typically isolated in a cell uh, without a cellmate or a cellie as they're called uh, to complete their um, period of isolation. Uh, there have been some hospitalizations. Unfortunately, I don't have the data on that, but it's surprisingly low. I think there have been a total of perhaps three deaths among inmates across the state. Uh, but they, again, that is preliminary uh, data. Um, this comes as a great surprise to us that we've not seen more um, hospitalizations to date and more severe illness. But uh, we consider uh, the state of Tennessee fortunate in that regard because if there were a lot of uh, symptoms among these populations and people needing hospitalizations that that could easily overwhelm uh, health care uh, facilities in those counties. Um, so we'll keep our fingers crossed, hope uh, we don't face that dilemma. Yeah, definitely. That sounds like a, a tough situation for sure. Um, and I think we actually received a question asking why Lake County had such a high number of cases. So um, I think that can be answered by the, the testing results that Dr. Workington mentioned. Um, I, we can take a step back and look at some of the questions that have been coming in through listeners. Um, we received a question regarding the distribution of remdesivir, which is a Gilead medication used for COVID-19 treatment. Um, so, the Tennessee Hospital Association should be sending out information to all member hospitals regarding the process of requesting that for hospitalized patients. Uh, my understanding is that they are working specifically with Vanderbilt University just because of its central location within the state, um, who will be handling the storage of the, the medication that's been allotted to Tennessee. But if you um, want to request that for one of your patients in a different hospital, obviously um, we will make sure that that gets to you. But Tennessee Hospital Association has taken on that responsibility for the first shipment that we've received from Desivir. Um, so more information to come on that and specifically on how to request it. I think they're working on a communication for that specifically. Um, one question, Dr. John, that we've received, and you might be able to answer this better than me, is are the federal prison cases reported at the state level? And I believe that they are, um, but just wanted to confirm that with you. That is correct. Okay. Um, and we also received a question that is, are prisoners trying to get infected in hopes of being released? I can take a stab and guess that we don't have that level of information. 
uh, Dr. John may have heard differently, but I imagine we, we don't get that level of detail from, from these folks. Yeah, and, and that is really not uh, a possibility with folks who are, um, who are offenders in the state prison system. Those are not folks who would be released just based on a, a positive COVID-19 test or becoming actually ill with it. Uh, we do know, interestingly, that the number of arrests has decreased uh, during the course of the pandemic in Tennessee. So there are actually lower populations in county jails now than they usually have. Um, and perhaps we're fortunate in that regard that there are few, fewer people who might be exposed to a positive staff member coming in and then spreading it among those who might bond out later or have a very short period of time in, in a county jail. But um, so far, uh, I think we're doing relatively well. Yeah, and I know that at a national level, there's been news of some prisons releasing um, nonviolent offenders or those with relatively short amounts of time left on their prison sentence, mainly to um, just alleviate crowding concerns that could contribute to COVID-19 spread. I don't believe that those prisons have been specifically targeting people who have tested positive for COVID-19 for release, but I'm sure that that varies, you know, based on a person-by-person -person basis within each individual prison. Yeah, I don't believe that anyone's being released from the state prison system on the basis of COVID-19. Correct, yeah. All right, any other? Um, one of the questions that we've received, um, what are guidelines for children, playdates, et cetera? Um, so CDC is releasing new guidance every day on these sorts of things as the economy reopens. I would, um, what I've been doing to try to keep up with it because there, it seems like there's new guidance, um, if not every day, um, certainly in many cases more often than once a day. If you Google or type into your search engine COVID-19, what's new CDC, you can see all of the documents that they've updated and the date that they were updated. I do believe that there is some specific for things like child care um, that you might find helpful. Um, the next question that we've received is the, what is the chance of an effective vaccine before the end of the year? I know that there are a lot of candidates out there. I don't know of any that are far enough along to even be within the realm of possible by the end of this year. Just based on what we know for vaccine development, I think that doing the safety evaluation and the efficacy evaluation, it seems, I would say, very unlikely for a vaccine to be ready by the end of the year. It would certainly be unprecedented, um, but I can certainly see if Dr. Fiscus has any more insight on that front. Um, another question we've received um, is regarding any cardiac defects that might be happening with the multi-system inflammatory syndrome um, associated with COVID-19. So I think there's certainly evidence of multi-system organ inflammation and there have definitely been cases of cardiac infarctions and cardiac ischemia associated with this. I don't know um, the, the frequency with which this has occurred because it is still such a rare condition, but it is one of the, um, it is part of the case definition for this. So I think it is something to look out for. All right, and I think that is it in terms of questions so far, but we'll hang out on the line for a few more minutes to see if anything else comes up. All right, everyone, uh, so I guess with that, um, we will keep it short for today, but again, Dr. Fiskus will be back next week and we'll try to have some more um, topics to discuss at that point, but feel free to continue um, emailing us with any questions or concerns.